Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship here at Faith United Methodist Church. Thank you, everyone who's joining us online as well. My name is Caitlin Nesbitt. I'm the associate pastor here at Faith United Methodist Church. The first reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. The second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How long has it been since you felt a level of contagious, infectious, unflappable, unstoppable happiness? Well, if you're like most people, the answer is, it's been a while. While everyone craves happiness and everyone benefits from it, the reality is that the majority of us can't find an adequate reason to check the yes box on a happiness questionnaire. In this six week study, we will look at the path that God lays out in his word for finding true and lasting joy. And we will see that doing good really does do good for the doer. So join me on this journey and together we will discover how to make happiness happen in our lives. Good morning and welcome again to Faith United Methodist Church. My name is Caleb Hong. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, today we do continue our sermon series called How Happiness Happens with Max Lucado. Uh, the premise of the series is very simple. It's that everyone wants happiness in life. Isn't that true? We all want happiness. We want it when, you're, when we're younger. We long for it when we're older. And rightfully so, because the benefits of happiness are obvious. Joy, contentment, satisfaction, and peace. The sense that life is good, that it's meaningful, that it's worthwhile. And then you consider the secondary benefits of happiness as well. Studies prove that happy people, they have stronger marriages, superior work performance. They are more effective leaders. Ha happier people tend to be healthier, they're less likely to get sick, and they're ca more capable of handling adversities in life. Everyone benefits from happiness. The trouble is this, fewer people are finding it. Everyone benefits from happiness, but fewer people are finding it. Only one-third of Americans surveyed by the Harris Poll, who've been, who's been conducting national polls for years, respond that they're happy which means that two-thirds of Americans, they're wondering, what is missing? What's the secret? What's the key to happiness in life? Is it education? Is it wealth? Is it health? Is it driving faster, dressing trendier, or drinking more? Does happiness happen when you lose the weight, or get the date, or find the mate, or discover your fate? Or is there something else that satisfies the deep, deep longing of our hearts? This is such an important question because um, <laughs> for obvious reasons, it affects all of our lives. And so we're going to focus six weeks on this question. More specifically, we're going to use Max Lucado's curriculum, which focuses on the one another statements of Jesus and the early church leaders. I shared last week, there's 59 one another statements in the New Testament. Every one of these statements, they are practical principles for how to make happiness happen. So here's the six uh, principles that we're going to cover in this series. Accept one another. Bear with one another. Serve one another. Forgive one another. Carry one another. Love one another. I know we've all heard this before, but I hope you hear this anew with a light of these are the keys to happiness. Let's pray and we'll begin. 
Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word. And thank you that in the midst of the busyness of life, as we want to run from schedule to appointments, in the midst of all that's going on, you invite us to be still and know that you are God, that you are walking with us, you are here with us, you desire to speak to us. So Lord, would you open our eyes to see and soften our ears to hear, and would you soften our hearts to receive the gift of your word for us this day? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Does anyone have a pet peeve? <laughs> yeah, maybe one of you. Okay. <laughs> Some of you said no. Um, if you're like me, you not only have one, you have many pet peeves. Uh, pet peeves, they are not colossal offenses. Pet peeves are not legal violations. Pet peeves are simply the things that you and I really, really don't like. They're the things that get under our skin. When other people do them, when we see them, it drives us nuts. She talks too loud. He talks too soft. He chews with his mouth open. She's such a picky eater. He drives like a maniac. She drives like my grandmother. She needs to talk about everything. He wants to talk about nothing. She twirls her hair when she talks. He bites his nails when he listens. She wears way too much makeup. He needs to wear deodorant. Bad, you know? <laughs> I don't know. What pet peeves bother you? Maybe some of these sound familiar. Again, these aren't matters of life or death. These are insignificant matters in the big picture. But they're irritating, and they're aggravating, and they're common right? They're common. Most importantly, if we let them, they are joy robbers. If we focus on them and we let them, these pet peeves, they're going to steal the happiness from our everyday lives, and not only from us, but the people we love the most. So let's turn to our first scripture for today. Ephesians 4.2. And Paul writes this, and I'm going to just give you two points today. Uh, if you want to write these down, I encourage you to write them down. If you have a great memory, memorize it. If you are questioning your memory, write it down, okay? <laughs> Ephesians 4.2, it goes like this. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Very simple. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So that word in that scripture that Paul writes, patience, it's a Greek word that's composed of two parts. The Greek word itself is macrothymia. You might recognize macro because it's the opposite of micro. Micro means small. Macro, long or big. Thymia, the Greek word for anger or temper, or we can use the vernacular fuse. So an impatient person is someone with a short temper, a short fuse. A patient person has a long temper, a long fuse. An impatient person responds quickly and reacts impulsively when something bothers them. A patient person bears with immediate irritants. They are tolerant of pet peeves and the annoying habits of others. Now some of you are wondering, why? Why do I have to tolerate, bear with, why do I have to you know, deal with the annoying habits of others? And the answer is, because I don't know if you recognize it or not, people have to put up with the annoying habits of you and me. If we ever wonder why we should bear with others, just as the scriptures teach us, Remember that others have to bear with us. They have to put up with our quirks, our habits. They have to endure our peculiarities and our idiosyncrasies. And whether you like it or not, recognize it or not, we do things and say things and act in ways that drive other people crazy. Ask your family. They'll tell you. Like when you pick your nose in public or you pick your toes all over the house, or you leave your clothes everywhere except the hamper, right? It's like magnetic everywhere except for the hamper. 
The next time you struggle to tolerate someone else, imagine how difficult it is for some people to tolerate you. Remember this, nobody is perfect. All of us are works in progress. That includes you, and that includes me too. I love the story that Max Lucado writes about a 90-year-old woman. Her name is Maria. Maria decided one Christmas that at the age of 90, she was tired of Christmas shopping. She didn't want to do it anymore. So she decided that she would just write checks to all of her family and friends. Just write checks. On each card, then, she wrote, Buy your own Christmas present, love grandma. <laughs> and she mailed the cards at the end of November so they would arrive in time for Christmas. But Maria found it odd that no one called or sent a note to thank her for a gift. She figured, you know, everyone's busy. In January, she's cleaning out her desk. And while she's cleaning off her desk, she discovers a stack of checks. And these were the checks made out to family and friends. These were the checks that should have been sent out with Christmas cards, whose words, buy your own Christmas present, now took on different meaning. Why do we have to bear with one another? Because let's face it, nobody's perfect. All of us are works in progress. This leads then to our second scripture for today, from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 7, Jesus, he's preaching from the Sermon on the Mount, right? The longest sermon that he has in the Gospels. Jesus, by the way, starts Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes, all about happiness. Chapter 7, he, adds, asks, he raises this very interesting question. He says, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice that log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take out that speck from your eye because it's bothering me. Well, there's a log still jammed in your eye. In other words, how can you be so sensitive to the imperfections of others and so dull to the imperfections of yourself? How can you be so bothered by another person's issues when the reality is your own issues are ten times worse? It's interesting, Jesus isn't telling us not to offer advice or helpful uh, criticism or direction when it's helpful or timely, but Jesus is encouraging us to follow a proper sequence. So if you want to offer constructive criticism to anyone, Jesus says this, begin by examining yourself. Verse 5. You hypocrite. The word hypocrite, actor, right? First, take that log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. So according to Jesus, step one for anyone who wants to comment on someone else's behavior is this. Remove that two-by-four redwood plank from your own eye. Start with yourself. Look at yourself before you look down on others. Examine your heart and your motive before you criticize and critique anyone else. Once you remove that log from your own eye, then you will see clearly. And then you'll be able to help others constructively, creatively, compassionately. As you engage in the work of lumber removal <laughs> from your eye, or from your life, that's when we mature. Your perspective will change. You will become gentler, wiser, more compassionate, kinder, more gracious. As we wrestle with our own issues, we become more empathetic to the struggles and the situations of others. We're able to be more patient. We're able to bear with our pet peeves and other circumstances, whatever they may be. Many of you are familiar with the evangelist D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, 19th century, influential Christian leader. You know, he was a, an amazing evangelist. He was also, uh, you know, uh, known for his publications. Uh, Moody, Moody Bible Institute, radio, right? Moody led thousands of people to Jesus Christ. But despite his fame, he was very humble. 
and he's known for saying this. Right now, I'm having so much trouble with D.L. Moody that I don't have time to find fault with anyone else. So let's heed the words of Ephesians 4.2, which says, Be patient. Bear with one another in love. Two stories. A young mother was relatively new to faith. The rest of her family, including her husband, they weren't Christians. But she was determined to raise her children in faith. So she found a church uh, around her community that she liked, and she started to attend that church's worship service with her children. The problem was her children were very young, and uh, her younger daughter in particular was squirmy. You know, the kind that just cannot sit still no matter what. And during one worship service, the children were so squirmy and disruptive and noisy that the preacher stopped in the middle of the sermon and asked the young mother to take better care of her children because they were being a distraction. That young mother left worship that day and didn't return the following week. She didn't return the week after either. The pastor's comments made her feel so embarrassed and unwelcomed, she didn't step into another church for seven years. That woman was my mother-in-law. When my wife, Sarah, told me this story, she gave me permission to share it. She wanted me to clarify that she's the oldest in the family. She wasn't the troublemaker in the story. In hindsight, what a loss, though. What a loss for her family. But I would say what a loss for the church as well. My mother-in-law, um, as it turned out, was a gifted teacher and evangelist. She led all of her other family members, including my father-in-law, to faith in Christ. She was one of the strongest leaders in her local church by the end of her life. I think about all the lives that might have been changed, all the good that might have been done, if the pastor had simply heeded the words of Ephesians 4.2, be patient, be kind, bear with one another in love. My second story comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. The story is told in Mark and also in Luke, but Mark, he writes about people bringing their babies, their children to Jesus. And these people, they just wanted to have Jesus touch them to have Jesus bless their children. But the disciples rebuked them. The disciples, they were offended. They were adamant that this was not going to happen. They didn't agree on a lot of things. They, were, they agreed on this. These young ones were not going to bother Jesus. My guess is it was one of their pet peeves. Why were these parents bringing babies to Jesus? Why were they bothering Jesus, the great rabbi, with these little ones who couldn't speak, teach, you know, do anything, who couldn't understand what Jesus would teach anyway? Mark tells us, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He was upset. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I love this picture because it shows a picture of Jesus embracing children, blessing infants. Jesus refused to be accessible only to the acceptable. No one was too young. No one was insignificant. No one was unimportant for God. That's the message. Happiness happens when we bear with one another. But Jesus, notice, he did more than just bear with the insignificant people in his life. Jesus welcomed them, and he encouraged them, and he found ways to bless them. So here's the, the second lesson I encourage you to write down, or if you have a great memory, memorize this, okay? When you encourage others, it's easier to bear with them. When you encourage others, it's easier to bear with them. When you focus on someone else's gifts and talents, when you focus on their promise and their potential, it is more likely that you will bear with the little things about them that bother you. Jesus was a wonderful encourager. 
whether it was seeing the, Levi, the, the potential of Levi, that despised tax collector, or whether it was seeing the potential of Simon, the fisherman with the foot-shaped mouth. Jesus had this way of encouraging others and helping others see their promise and potential long before they did. You know, another encourager in the Bible, his name is Barnabas. Barnabas, the word Barnabas in the Greek literally means son of encouragement. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that when Barnabas heard that many in the early church were suffering financially, he sold part of his property, just gave the proceeds to the apostles to care for them. And then a little later, this is in Acts chapter 9, we know that Saul, the persecutor of the church, met Christ on the road to Damascus. And when Saul became Paul and became a Christian, the trouble he ran into is everyone still recognized him as Saul. They still distrusted him. No one wanted to talk with him until Barnabas. Barnabas was the first believer to advocate for Paul. He was the first believer to say, God is doing a good work in Paul's life. Let's support him and pray for him and bless him in ministry. Acts 9. So with Barnabas' encouragement and support, Paul became what? He became the New Testament's greatest evangelist and the writer of much of the New Testament. Encouragers, they are so important. They don't simply see our present imperfections. They see our promise. They see the best in us. They speak words of love that help us reach our potential. I like what Max Lucado writes about encouragers in his book. He writes, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, the author of Positivity and a social psychologist in North Carolina, asserts that positive emotions increase our awareness allowing us to see the big picture and expand our peripheral vision. By opening up the mind, positive emotions, they help us strengthen our relationships, and they even improve our physical health because they increase our energy. Stated differently, if a soccer coach wants to increase the odds of a player missing another goal, he should get angry, lose his temper, and shout at her. On the other hand, if that coach wants the player to return to the game with better vision, he should offer her a word of encouragement. People have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be, not what you nag them to be. I want to say that again. People have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be, not what you nag them to be. Anyone else find this true? Right? I find this true too. Nagging your spouse or your children or your grandchildren, they may change behavior for a moment, but in the big picture, it means that other people are going to tune you out and not listen to a word you say. On the other hand, when you cultivate a habit of encouragement, you positively influence the development of people around you. You make them want to listen to you. You make them want to be around you, which, by the way, makes you happier. Personally, I can tell you that I am who I am today, not because of the naggers in my life, but because of the encouragers in my life. Because of the friends and family who believed in me and saw my potential when I doubted it. Because of the teachers and mentors who took the time to listen to me, to tell me I had promise, to tell me that God had wonderful purpose and plans for my life. I am who I am because of church members who encouraged me to persevere early in ministry when I wanted to give up and work in a movie theater, frankly. <laughs> All right? That's what I wanted to do. When I was frustrated and wanted to give up, I was encouraged. I am who I am today because I have a spouse and two amazing children who remind me every day that I am important to them and that I am loved. So every day when I wake up, I pray that God would use me to encourage someone else. And every day when I wake up, I pray that God would give me patience 
to bear with people, even those with whom I disagree. It's okay. Every day when I wake up, I pray that God would allow me to remind other people that I meet at church, at school, at the stores, in the parking lots, that they are important and loved by God. And if I see a name tag, I'm going to tell it to him. You know, not that you're loved by God, but thank you. Thank you for what you do. You're important. Friends, I hope you'll do likewise. I hope that you'll bear with one another. And I hope that you'll encourage each other, not because a preacher asked you to, but because you realize this really is how happiness happens. I'm going to close with a story that Max uses to close session two. So some of this, you will hear this twice. Max writes, one of my favorite places on earth, it's a grove that sits on the Guadalupe River, only minutes from my home. It's a peaceful place. Lazy, puffy clouds float overhead. A tall bluff barricades the strong winds. There's bass fishing, uh, swimming along the rocks. Grass grows along the banks. And the trees, oh, the trees. Cypresses line the river's edge. Mesquite and Texas oak stretch their limbs and dig deep roots in the soil. They weather the winters, they celebrate the summers, and they are all bent. There's not a straight trunk among them. They all lean, they all turn. There is no perfectly straight tree. Even so, they provide a perfect place to find peace. They, find, uh, they offer that place for fishermen to doze in their shade, that place where birds can build nests on their branches, that place where squirrels can quarry homes in their trunks. Humanity is a, light like, a lot like this grove of trees. Though we attempt to always stand tall, none of us perfectly succeed. We twist and we turn, we have gnarly bark. Some of us have trunks that are mossy. Others of us have branches that are heavy. We are a collection of bent timber. And that's okay, because there's beauty in our bentness. So enjoy the society of the bent timber. Cut people some slack. Ease up on your criticisms. Reduce your number of peeves and be patient with the people who pet them. The world, for all its quirky people, is actually a wonderful place to live. And the sooner we find the beauty, the happier we will be. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your words of life. That in the midst of searching, and wondering in the midst of wandering and waiting Lord you meet us right where we are you meet us in the midst of our imperfections in the midst of our almost theirs in the midst of our frustration in the midst of our grief in the midst of sadness you meet us right where we are. And you remind us that you came so that we might have life. You remind us that you walk with us in even the darkest of valleys. And you want to offer us peace. So thank you for your gift. Thank you that you meet us right where we are. And I pray, Lord, that even as you're doing a good work in us, that you would help us to reflect your goodness to others. That we would know this promise that not only when we receive love from you, but when we reflect it to others. Lord, that's what we're created to do. Not only when we realize you're so patient with us, but when we're patient with others. Not only when you put up with us, but when we're able to put up with others, bear with others, love others for all their idiosyncrasies. That's just the reflection of love. So meet us right where we are. Lord, some of us, we have some relationships coming to mind right now that are difficult, maybe with children or grandchildren. 
maybe with siblings, with some of us parents, where, par- where relationships are strained because of our impatience. Lord, would you uh, renew our hearts? Would you give us courage and the confidence to not only hear your word this day, but to put it to action this day, this week? Thank you for your word, for your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, make signs of love for each other. And if you would, show this to the people around you. Again, if, if you leave this worship service and you forget everything else, but just simply this fact, that you are loved, you're loved just as you are, then we've done our job as a church. God loves you so much just as you are. The good news, God loves you just as you are. The bad news, God loves the people you don't like to. <laughs> That's the reality. Let's bear with each other. Be patient with each other. None of us are perfect. We're all works in progress. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the first.